All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming to this teleseminar on deep resilience from me to we with Rebecca Blanco. Uh, my name is Don Hall. I'll be hosting this call on behalf of Transition US. Um, this call is sponsored by Transition US, which is a national hub for the international transition network, which is now in over 50 countries. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about transition, uh, just go to transitionus.org. Our principal aim at Transition US is to provide practical support to leaders of transition initiatives, those mulling over starting an initiative, and community leaders working on resilience building within their communities. We want to continue to offer these webinars at no cost, but we do ask that you consider making a donation to help us do so. Uh, we have a donation button near the top of our website at transitionus.org. Uh, thank you in advance for anyone who is able to contribute in this way. Uh, if you are unable to contribute financially, we ask that you consider uh, volunteering either with Transition US, with a local resilience building effort in your community, or uh, with one of the uh, efforts that our presenter, Rebecca Blanco, uh, is involved in. Uh, so while more people are arriving, I just wanted to update you on a few uh, upcoming events that we have uh, with Transition US. Um, we have another teleseminar coming up uh, this Monday uh, with Tina Clark, uh, transition trainer, uh, talking about taking your transition initiative to the next level. Uh, that's going to be on Monday, July 10th, uh, at 3 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, so that would be uh, 6 p.m. on the East Coast. And you can find more information about that on Facebook. Uh, you can go to the Transition US page and click on events. Uh, and there is a place to register there for free. Um, both Tina and Rebecca will be offering uh, pre-conference intensive trainings uh, at our national gathering, the first ever Transition US national gathering, which is coming up. Uh, the pre-conference intensives start on Thursday, July 27th, uh, and the main conference starts the following day, uh, Friday, July 28th, and runs through Sunday, July 30th. This will be held at McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota, uh, and we'll, we hope that everybody on this call will come and attend, uh, besides uh, six amazing pre-conference intensives. We're going to have three great keynotes with uh, Richard Heinberg uh, from Post Carbon Institute, uh, Rob Hopkins, uh, the founder of the International Transition Movement, and Phyllis Young, a Standing Rock elder and water protector. We'll have 40 workshops, uh, bioregional breakouts, and open space sessions. Uh, so it's going to be an amazing time. And if you haven't gotten your ticket yet, uh, go to transitiongathering.org uh, to find more information and to uh, link to register. Uh, we do have a deadline coming up on Monday for dorm housing at McAllister College uh, and for purchasing meal plans uh, at the McAllister College cafeteria. So. Uh, if you are looking to sign up for either of those, please do so before Monday. The platform that we're using today for this call is Maestro Conference. Uh, it's an audio-only platform, uh, but hopefully you have received a copy of Rebecca's slides. Uh, we sent them out to everybody who had registered this morning, I believe. Uh, if not, you can go to the Transition US Dot org website, uh, click on this teleseminar event from the main page, and you can download the PDF from there. Uh, if you don't have access to the PDF, don't worry about it. Uh, Rebecca will be describing all the slides as she goes through them. Uh, everyone is on mute right now. 
uh, but you can press 1 uh, throughout the call and particularly during our question and answer after Rebecca's presentation to raise your hand and be called on. Uh, we'll also be doing a couple of polls uh, where you can press different numbers on your keypad to give different responses. All right, uh, so without further ado, I want to introduce Rebecca Blanco. Uh, who is a good friend of mine uh, and somebody I have tremendous respect for. Uh, during the last four decades, Rebecca Blanco has served as an eco-centered psychotherapist, presented an array of personal growth workshops, and completed a master's and a doctorate. Feeling concerned about the severe challenges we are facing, Rebecca delved into eco-psychology and deep ecology, perspectives that enable us to understand the interconnections between ecological, social, and psychological forces, as well as the manner in which these reveal the complexity of our planetary crisis. Um, Rebecca has also participated in numerous programs and trainings, including transition training, uh, permaculture design certification course, consultations with uh, eco-psychology instructors, uh, Joanna Macy's The Work That Reconnects, and uh, Awakening the Dreamer from the Pachamama Alliance. She is the founder and chairperson of The Bridge, a community-oriented organization designed to explore paradigm-shifting ideas, uh, and she is full-heartedly dedicated to facilitating workshops that support eco-centered personal transformation. Uh, so with great pleasure, uh, I will introduce Rebecca and uh, turn it over to her. Thank you, Dylan, and thank you for uh, having me. Um, thank you to all the transition team for having me and for supporting the inner transition in the way that you do. Um, so I'm going to begin with some introductory comments. Um, so I, and I'm going to assume that uh, most people have the slides, but like. Don said, I'll, uh, I'll try to make it so that if you don't have the slides in front of you, you're not missing out on a whole lot. But the title slide, and, and what I'll do is I'll, uh, I'll, each slide has a number and I'll identify the number so that if you do, and hopefully you do have the slide presentation in front of you, you can follow as I go and let you, I'll let you know what slide we're on. It does help to have the slide in front of you, especially when it comes to inner work because inner work the inner dimension of our humanity is invisible, and it's nice to have uh, images and symbols to represent it. So in the title slide, uh, Deep Resilience from Me to We, we have a, a quote here by Charles Eisenstein, and it says, a reconceiving of who we are can reverse the crisis of our age. And Charles' words here get to the heart of the matter regarding our purpose today. Uh, very broadly, I'm going to be demonstrating how this reconceiving of who we are is taking place with a focused look at personal resilience as it pertains to social and ecological challenges um, and our role as activists. Also, since this is about deep resilience and since the inner world is multifaceted, at times what I'm going to do is peel the layers of the psychic onion, so to speak, and take a look at what there might be under the surface. And towards the end, we'll spend a few minutes on ways to move from the intrapsychic to the interpersonal or from the me to the we. And then, of course, we'll end with the part of the seminar that I'm very much looking forward to, and that's hearing your insights, your perspectives, and your experiences. A few points I want to make before we launch into this. Uh, when we delve into inner phenomenon, we're in very subjective territory. And what this means simply is that as I see it, there's no absolute truth except for each individual, and that approaching this with a lot of humility is pretty important. Also, um, given that inner phenomena is invisible, as I said earlier, I do use metaphors and images throughout the seminar. Some of the topics that I'm going to address today, I suspect are going to be very familiar to some of you. And in addition, some of it is going to seem like common sense or like conventional wisdom. So at those times, what might be most relevant is are questions like how can then we together as a community proactively explore these inner world matters? Or how do we, and how do we do this in ways that are as inclusive as possible? And also, what has been said that, that what has not been said 
that needs to be said about these familiar topics or what has not been asked that needs to be asked. So on that uh, note on familiarity, if you can go to slide number two, there is a poll there, and, and that poll is going to give me an idea as to what, uh, where people are at, uh, first with it, just the inner world, and, and secondly with um, where you are with simply being resilient. So I'm going to go ahead and, um, and read the poll, the poll number one out loud. And Carolyn, if there's anything that you want to say um, about the technology of it, please do. No, I think we're good to go, Rebecca. Um, you'll be suggesting, I, I believe, that people press numbers on their phone keypad to participate in the poll. So if those of you who can do that, um, listen to Rebecca now with the poll and press the appropriate numbers. So uh, poll number one is um, just press one on your phone keypad if you have been very active doing inner work, if it's your primary focus or your number one passion. Number two, if you've been moderately active doing both inner work and outer work pretty, fairly equally. And press number three if you are primarily focused on shifting the outer world, the external structures, yet occasionally engaged in inner work. And then press four if you're new to inner work and are now wanting to learn more about this. Great. So if everybody could press one to four on your keypad. One is uh, inner work is your primary focus. Four is you're very new to this. I see a couple of hands going up. Um, wait just a moment more, see if anybody else responds. Okay, well, we haven't heard from everybody, but uh, we heard from 22% of the folks uh, who are on this call, and they all said, uh, that they are primarily focused on shifting the outer world, yet occasionally engage in inner work. Ah, so that's very helpful. Great, thank you. Okay, so let's go ahead and move to poll number two, which is about your assessment as to how you're doing as far as being personally resilient, that you're able to bounce back whenever you're facing a challenge in your activism. So person number one on your phone keypad, if you see yourself as being extremely resilient, you're able to bounce back, and not only that, you learn a lot from the challenges. Press number two, if you see yourself as moderately resilient. Three, if you see yourself as minimally resilient and you can use learning some coping mechanisms. And press number four, if you see yourself as non-resilient. Okay, again, we'll Take a few more moments to see if anybody else responds. Here we go. Um, one for extremely resilient, down to four for non-resilient. Okay, great. Right. Well, thank you for participating. So, so um, yeah, Rebecca, we have 27% uh, of the people on the call said that they are extremely resilient. Uh, ah. 27 percent said that they are moderately resilient, and the other 56% uh, did not respond. Okay. So uh, that gives you a little bit of sense. Okay, very good. Thank you for, um, for participating in this, and at least it's good to have an idea. Uh, and I certainly in my own life um, continually engage in processes by which I build my own personal resilience. So uh, hopefully this uh, talk will be useful to some of you in some ways. So if you go to slide three, um, where it says inner work on the top, so there are some, there are four, these are four of the big questions that the territory of inner work poses. And we're not going to try to answer those questions today, but simply identify them as pointers in the inner world. Uh, what these questions suggest that that we're, is that we're now facing the opportunities for profound internal transformation, for a significant evolution of consciousness. And the questions are, who are we to be? 
that's essential to life-affirming communities? What does the inner transition look like that supports, reflects, or initiates outer change? And what forms of internal development do we mobilize now as we create the society that we yearn to live in? And to take this a deep, uh, a little deeper, we can ask a two-part personal question, and that is, what are these uncertain times asking of me now? And what internal obstacles do I want to overcome so that I can respond more fully and with more ease to that request? And these are only four of the questions. Uh, the inner transition world is filled with very rich and important questions. The mutual impact between psyche and social and ecological conditions, the inner and the outer worlds, have been recognized for many years. And we're going to take a, a brief look at how this has been unfolding over time with a closer look at our time today. Um, this is partly to describe the context for deep resilience, but also to celebrate many unfolding endeavors that are related to inner work today. So if you can go to slide number three. And at slide number three, we have... Um, uh, two quotes, and one is by Ralph Waldo Emerson. So this was uh, said back in the mid-1800s. Ralph Waldo Emerson was considered a radical reformer, and his thoughts were actually considered to be the foundation of an evolved human culture. He said the reason why the word la world lacks unity and lies broken and in heaps is because man is just united with himself. And it might be interesting to note that he was bearing witness to the early stages of the Industrial Revolution. And then 100 years later, we have Carl Jung. And although he's known more for his ideas on synchronicity and archetype and shadow and collective unconscious, he was also fascinated by indigenous cultures. And he visited Africa a few times and investigated the separation of human beings from their own primal nature. And he said, civilized man is in danger of losing all contact with the inner world, with the world of instinct. This loss of instinct is largely responsible for the pathological conditions of contemporary culture. If you could go to uh, slide five, we have two gentlemen, two cultural historians who both passed away relatively recently. We have Thomas Berry, who is preferred to be identified as a geologian or an earth scholar. And he said any recovery of the natural world in its full splendor will require not only a new economic system, but a conversion experience deep in the psychic structure of the human. And then we have Theodore Rozak, who, is, who wrote the book, The Voice of the Earth, where he coined the term eco-psychology. And he states that we, particularly those of us in the psychology field, ignore the greater ecological realities that surround the psyche, as if the soul can be saved while the biosphere crumbles. And we can shift that statement around and say, as if the biosphere can be saved while the soul crumbles. And if you can go to slide six, we have a growing number of people today speaking and acting on behalf of the intersection of inner and outer work. And among them are Sophie Banks, who is highly instrumental in, in getting the inner transition off the ground from transition to town taught Ness, and she said, our own health and healing is an essential part of the healing for our species, which goes to the heart of the matter. And each one of these, by the way, um, speak to a slightly different aspect of the inner world. And then we have Linda Buzel, who said, it is crucial to understand the connections between the epidemic of mental distress and the destruction of our own habitat. And then we have Mary Jane Rust who said, how might we understand and confront the shadow side of human nature that have led us to this point of global crisis? And then we have John Seed, who's a rainforest activist and worked very closely with Jonah Macy. And he said, Paul Ehrlich thinks that we're sawing off the branch that we're sitting on. Sounds to me like some kind of psychological problem. And then finally, we have Marilyn Levin who said, we get to rise to the occasion to confront the challenges of our time with our fullest humanity as our greatest resource. And if you go to slide six, what one of the most, one other relevant um, development is coming forth now, and it's a reorientation of our relationship to Earth, to cosmos. It's another perspective of how the boundary between the inner and the outer world are being recognized as arbitrary. 
And it has to do with the notion of reclaiming the earth as a universe. It's a living, intelligent organism rather than an inert mechanical entity, which is the mindset that the scientific revolution brought us. So we see this development in many arenas, including the scientific community, as depicted here by Stefan Harding. He's a zoologist that works at Schumacher College, and he says, right action requires us to live into the body of the earth, that wider body. And also the wilderness-based communities, we have Janine Marie Hogan, who says, if we cultivate the imaginative consciousness of the anima mundi, which is the soul of the earth, would we be able to continue shutting down Earth's life support systems? And then we have Thich Nhat Hanh from the mi mindfulness community who says, you carry Mother Earth within you in that insight of interbeing. It is possible to have real communication with the Earth, which he considers the highest form of prayer. And then if you go to slide eight, So we can see that the relevance of inner work is also illustrated in many developmental maps and in practical initiatives that are now well underway. And we're all familiar probably with the permaculture flower and with permaculture itself. And as many of you probably know, a permaculture has included people care as an essential aspect. Interestingly, though, David Holmgren, who's the core originator of the term permaculture, decided, described people care as a vexed issue for, for designers. In other words, one that historically has been pretty perplexing for the permaculture community. So he praises Luby McNamara and as a, her work in, in the book uh, People and Permaculture, which came out about six, seven years ago, as a significant contribution to the evolution of permaculture. And in this book, she widens the definition of permaculture from being mainly about land-based systems to the inner work. And she helps, in this book, she addresses the importance of reconnecting to each other and to our inner selves. And she, by the way, calls this inner self zone zero, zero. And she also talks about this zone zero, zero as being the place where we have the most influence. So if you go to the next so slide, you're going to see uh, something that you're probably also very familiar with, and that's the aqua um, quadrant. And the, the main thing I want to say about this is that uh, Ken Wilber considers it a, a very good indexing tool or a guiding map. So it helps us identify what aspect of reality is absent and we need to attend to in any one of the projects that we're engaged in. So, for example, as we attend to inner work, what we're doing is accentuating the upper left quadrant, which often is diminished in, conventionally, in conventional activism. So what we're doing then is bringing a neglected quadrant to the fore. So if you go to slide not, uh, 10, what we have here is, the, is a slide on eco-psychology. And eco-psychology, restoring the earth, healing the mind, was the first eco-psychology anthology. And the the statement in the, in the image that says ecology needs psychology, psychology needs ecology, is a statement that goes to the heart of the matter as far as what eco-psychology represents. Um, it's really a marriage of the two fields. Uh, the themes that eco-psychology eco addresses are, the, are uh, psyche and nature embedded in each other, the ecological and the psychological crisis are aspects of one multifaceted challenge. The renewal of earth and of self are inseparable. Earth is alive and has psychic depths. Reconnecting with wilderness returns us to ourselves. And I want to stop here for a minute and share some words by John Weir, who uh, founded the Sierra Club. And he said, the clearest way into the universe is through a forest wilderness. He said, I only went out for a walk and finally concluded to stay out until sundown, for going out, I found, was really going in. So John Weir is often not recognized for the inner work, and yet he, he illustrated it. And lastly, uh, one, another theme of eco-psychology is that our grief for the planet reflects our nestedness in the world. So eco-psychology is a very exciting field that's surfacing out of our particular historical conditions. The fact that we're facing challenges that are at once psychological, social, and ecological. 
and it offers a lens through which we can investigate this complexity, but it also offers a canvas upon which we can develop and apply practical and health-centered forms of intervention. It's a very wide open field. Andy Fisher, who's an eco-psychology theorist and practitioner, he said that there's a lot of room to maneuver within, within this terrain. So uh, if you go to uh, slide 11, um, what we have here is uh, a triangle, a very simple triangle that Andy Fisher presented. He is, uh, he's the author of Radical Eco-Psychology, Psychology in the Service of Life, and he's contributed tremendously to the field of psychology. And he offers a very thorough explanation of this triangle. And a talk that he gives at Schumacher College, it's very easy to access online. So I'm going to extrapolate one particular point that will be relevant when we delve, with into, when we delve into um, deep resilience. So he, he uses this triple integration, which he says it's a triple integration that can steer us to places we, we, that we might not otherwise go. So he uses this to demonstrate how contemporary social forces violate nature, both human nature, which is the psyche, and other than human nature. And he underscores in particular the extent to which capitalism exerts a systematic violation of life. It de deanimates the natural world, and it basically diminishes to quote-unquote brute matter or raw materials, ultimately corporatizing the life world for the sole purpose of accumulating capital. So from Andy's perspective, to go to the psychological roots of the ecological crisis, we need to explore ways to untangle the psyche to recover the human soul from the forces of our nature-dominating social systems. And if you go to the next slide, which is slide 12, and you don't, this is full of information, and you don't need to absorb uh, uh, any of it right now, uh, but I did want to uh, present this eco-soul-centric developmental wheel. Our historical context has also given rise to this groundbreaking model of human development that's based on nature and soul. And it's developed by eco-psychologist Bill Plotkin, who's the founder of Animus Valley Institute. And um, it's, it's a model that, of what the stages of human life look like when we mature in full resonance with both nature and soul. And it also provides the foundation for cultural transformation. Bill states, and I'm, I'm going to paraphrase, that underlying the life-destroying activities of industrial civilization are epidemic failures in individual human development, and that these failures have culminated in what he calls a pathologically adolescent society. And that what we need is to awaken from the contemporary mainstream fiction and into the life of, of the more-than-human world and into the life of the soul, which is our own true human nature. And then if you go to slide 13, what we have here is something that uh, I, I suspect also many people are very familiar with, and that is the wonderful work that reconnects, which uh, probably some of us have taken in order to take part in the healing of our world by Joanna Macy, and it incorporates a lot of inner work. Uh, the one thing that I'd like to simply bring out about the work that reconnects at this moment is that one of the radical, one of the several radical elements of the of this work, is that it helps to break the culturally conditioned habit of denying or repressing our pain for the world, and furthermore, of our viewing it as a private pathology, as if it's something wrong with us. And then finally, but not least, we have on slide 14. Uh, the transition movement, which, like no other movement as far as I know, is ahead of the curve in regards to its assimilation of inner work within the larger transformation movement from the beginning. And that inner work has culminated into what will be happening in two weeks at the first transition gathering where not only am I offering a one-day intensive on the Friday before, but there's nine workshops on the inner work um, throughout the weekend. So if you go to slide 15, um, what you're going to see is uh, the forest. And by the way, some of these, uh, there's a few slides of nature 
and these are actually of natural landscapes uh, very close to the St. Paul area. Uh, so it's the beautiful earth around the region where we're going to be in a couple of weeks, or some of us are going to be in a couple of weeks. So if we can just stay on this slide for a minute, what, what I'd like to offer here is just a, to, a summary and say that the brief, uh, what we see here, what I've just said is a brief, has been a brief overview of, of converging, unfolding endeavors that are prioritizing a whole-centered way of life, and that this whole includes the inner dimensions of our humanity. Um, and what we're also seeing is that there seems to be a widespread growing agreement that the restoration of ourselves and our ecosystems are inseparable and that personal transformation is an access point or a leverage point for community transformation and that our fullest humanity or our greater potential is an essential source of wisdom during this time. And also, finally, that psychological wellness is probably at this point an ethical imperative. So we, before we move on to, t to look at deeper salience more closely, let's take a minute to just reflect on how this information has impacted you and what you would add based on your own experiences, ideas that you might want to share during the second half of our time together here. So I'm going to just stop talking just for a few seconds. So developing a deep resilience is a vi uh, clearly a vital aspect of doing inner work. And it's a, it's, it's a state of well-being, and it actually becomes the bedrock for further personal and social transformation. And here's a, um, if you go to slide 16, here's a, a, a definition of deep resilience as it relates to our role as activists as we do our part to create a more life-affirming community. So deep resilience is, refers to a constellation of inner qualities that work together synergistically so they impact one another, enabling us as change makers to both weather the storm of our advocacy and of our times and to grow more whole and whole-centered. And when we're in a deep resilient state, we're able to bring forth our contributions to life-affirming communities in ways that are probably increasingly more pioneering, galvanizing, filled with ease, more meaningful, graceful, and fun. So in a nutshell, it's an optimized way of relating to our challenges as activists that rises from a deeply rooted or an unshakable vitality. So if you can go to slide 17, we're going to, these are four, four guiding questions and they're very straightforward questions that are going to guide our discussion about deep resilience. So if you want to go to slide number 18. So these are the, the first, this is the first question, and that is, what are the unique stressors and challenges that we face as change makers? And this is not a complete list, um, so there's a possibility that some of you might not resonate with any of these at all, uh, but at, during the conversation at the end, it'd be interesting and very, I'm very, I'd be very eager to hear what are the, 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 the stressors and the challenges that you've perceived. So these are, you could consider these as risk factors as well, and they certainly vary from person to person. Um, I'm going to mention them. I'm not going to get into them in any depth, uh, and we'll see how that goes. So we'll definitely delve into them more deeply during the one-day intensive at the gathering. So there also we can also look at these stresses from an internal. There are stressors that come from within us and stressors that come from the outside. So the first one in, uh, inter as an internal stressor, the first is thinking traps. And that is any thought that leads us to a negative emotional space. Then we have persistent uncomfortable emotions. And uncomfortable emotions are not in and of themselves problematic, but when they become persistent, when they become knots inside that we do, do not untangle, cannot untangle, then they can become risk factors. The tension that uh, exists, that could exist between the reality and our ideals. It's, this is, in other words, this is the tension that, that could emerge as a result of living in between two worlds or living in between two, two, two stories, the liminal times that we're in. Most, most of us are witnessing a world that's very different from the world we envision and that the, from the world we're trying to create. 
Some examples might be that we might we want to see reverence for life and instead we see domination. We want to see more reciprocity and instead we see oppression and authoritarianism. We want to see collaboration and instead we see competition. We want to see creativity or simplicity and instead we see hyperconsumption and so on. And then related to that is our embeddedness in the unsustainable systems. The, the recognizing that, that we are part of it uh, to some extent, at least some of us are. Um, every time I put gas in my car, I think, well, this is not what I want to do, uh, but I can't live without putting gas in my car. Uh, so sometimes we, in, in, we recognize our own complicity in that which we do not value, and we might even experience some guilt as a result of it. And the next one is unawareness of our own unique gifts and our own temperament. And I'll explain that later. Uh, and then an adversarial stance, which usually means a mindset that, that has to do with a, uh, it's a villain victim mindset. We all might be familiar with the story of a captive monk who is asked in prison what his greatest fear is. And he says, my greatest fear is losing compassion for my captor. And feeling separated or loss of communion with the world of nature. Uh, this is a sensation of having our roots pulled out from the earth community, thus feeling disconnected from our living source. So if we go to the external stressors, just facing the immensity of it, of it all, the Goliath and, and the David and Goliath archetypal story. And information overload, a, a lot of us have flooded news, news feeds. And also severe language in the news or severe language in some of the, the, the information that we read, words like lapse, disaster, urgent, mass extinction, fighting, extremism. I mean, this is not to deny that, that these severe conditions don't exist. Some of them do. But this is simply to state that an overload of this type of language can produce a chronic state of agitation and an ongoing fight or flight response in our nervous system, sometimes in ways that we don't even realize. Actions that don't match our temperaments, an example of that would be if, uh, if I have a tendency to, to thrive as an introvert because I do my best work in solo activities, but I find myself doing most of my activism in, in work, in groups that require group work or in rallies, then I might get drained or vice versa. If I'm more of an extrovert, extrovert where I thrive and do my best in groups, and then I find myself doing a lot of my activism behind the scenes, doing solo work, that might drain me. Lack of community support and connection, that speaks for itself, I think. Pervasive conflict in our teams. Uh, conflict in our teams is not bad in and of itself. It, it can be very good. It's opportunities to grow. But it's when the conflicts don't get resolved that become a risk factor. And slow changes and lack of funding, that speaks for itself. Um, but so to take that a bit deeper, to take these uh, challenges a bit deeper, is the ex we talk about the ex we can talk about the exploitation, the discrimination, colonization that exists in our culture, the wounding impact of these social and economic systems, such as institutionalized racism. So if you go to uh, slide 20, um, this is what is the cost of non-resilience to us as individuals and to the movement. I'm going to move through this slide pretty pretty quickly. Uh, so obviously irritability, impatience, brokenheartedness, anxiety, negative emotions, negative states. And it's when they become severe that they could, that, that could lead to a, to a state of burnout. Um, and then we look like that little puppy there. We don't want to get there. We, we definitely want to do everything in, in our power to, to prevent that. But the other cost is that it actually hinders our human potential. Our human potential lives as possibilities within us yet to be tapped into, and when we're in a non-resilient state, our energies go to basically keeping our heads above water, psychologically speaking, and there's little or no energy left to access and cultivate the possibilities that lie inside of us in our highest poten uh, potential, our highest intention. And the, uh, the cost of the movement or to the community is pretty, pretty straightforward in the sense that when we're not at our best, our mo the movement and the community doesn't get to benefit from our strengths and our, um, our, best, our best qualities. A deepening here is that when, we've, when we're not at our best, when we're struggling and we're not able to get 
through the struggle. We can also feel embarrassed and shame as a result of that. And usually that embarrassment and that shame is fostered by the inner critic. And I want to offer an antidote to that inner critic as an alternative perspective to this shame. So if you could go to uh, slide 21. So I'm not going to read that quote. You're welcome to read it at your own leisure. But it's a beautiful uh, quote by a psychiatrist, a Polish psychiatrist by the name of Kazimierz Stoporowski. And he believed, and I'm going to use this language, that advanced development required the, requires the breakdown of lower psychological structures through this process that he calls positive disintegration. So it's very possible that when we are in a non-resilient state, we could interpret this as something is breaking down that actually needs to break down and doesn't serve us anymore, and it doesn't serve the higher good anymore. This is really similar to Richard Bach's simpler statement. He said, what the caterpillar calls the end of the world the master calls the butterfly. And this also refers to uh, what people in the resilience world call post-stress growth, which is a breakthrough after the breakdown. And I don't want to oversimplify the process of disintegration. We do um, sometimes go through very difficult times when we're not able to bounce back. Um, and and uh, that process of disintegrating, we're not feeling like we're bouncing back, requires diligent and discerning inner work. But positive disintegration is a great reframe and a great um, uh, uh, step to, to, to look at pretty seriously. Um, so if you go to slide 22, just take a minute to reflect here on uh, what you might want to add to this conversation in regards to the stressors and the cost. This is another uh, landscape near St. Paul. And then if you want to move to slide 23, what are the elements that comprise a flourishing state of resilience? And this is, these are some, um, uh, we'll, we, each of us will have our own, I'm sure. But this is what we're like when our adaptation capacities are at their very best, when our way of relating to our environment is optimal, when positive disintegration has lived out its full process and we arrive at a different level that's aligned with our greater visions. So these are the qualities that we want to cultivate or the personal goals that we want to aim for as defined by each of us. So these are not prescriptive. So uh, they include communion with the wild, uh, mental and emotional equanimity, capacity to hold attention with grace, acting from our gifts and from our true authentic temperaments, able to, when we're able to see humanity, the humanity of the wrongdoer, and also when we're able to take a long view or an evolutionary perspective, and then we don't get lost in the moment. Self-awareness as a guiding principle. Openness to many perspectives. Communication and conflict skills. Sense of creativity and aliveness. A sense of acceptance of what is rather than uh, fighting what is. And a sense of lightness, being able to um, laugh uh, kindly and respectfully at each other, at ourselves. Um, and the transition movement is really good about emphasizing the importance of having fun. Emma Goldman, who is an uh, activist from the turn of the century, she said, if I can't dance, it's not my revolution. Now, I said in the... Uh, in the uh, definition that uh, these qualities work synchronistically with each other or, or synergistically with each other, like a flourishing ecosystem. And some examples of how they might work synergistically are the general, are, uh, I'd like to share a few, is the general capacity to see various perspectives and help us see the humanity of the wrongdoer, or communion with nature and emotional equanimity can actually enhance each other. And when we act from our gifts and from our temperaments, we can actually develop more creativity and aliveness. So if you go to the next slide, which is the fourth and final question, and that is what can we do to cultivate the inner qualities that help us blossom as trailblazers and skillfully catalyze transformation? 
So what are the ways to a more resilient state? What are the practices, life choices that we can make? So this is about developing protective factors. You can call them protective factors that buffer us from stress or and also the keys that open the doors to further growth. So what we're going to do is look, look uh, at a few of down-to-earth practices and a few life choices. But first, and again, peeling the layers of that onion, I'm going to look at the question within this question, and that is what can we do on a more subtle level to support our inner work, to bolster, to reinforce our practices and our life choices? So in other words, there are many practices and life choices that build resilience, and we'll talk about a few. However, foundational to these are some deeper events that are worth looking at more closely, I think. And these are subtle actions that take place in the more internal layers of our psyche. These are the what I call the substructures of the inner world. So if you go to the next slide, slide 25, you'll see here a Zen circle. And you'll see that inside of the Zen circle represents that inner layer of the psyche. These events that happen in here are private. They usually occur in our own hearts and souls. They're subtle. They, they're usually not concretely palpable in and of themselves, and they're powerful, just like structural beings are to a well-built home. Uh, this is, again, zone zero, zero, as Lubi McNamara stated, and this is possibly the area that we have the most influence. Some people might call this um, area uh, or refer to this area as the invisible structures, which is a term we're familiar if we know about permaculture. But others might call this the the inner postures or the pillars. I prefer to call it the fertile soil of our inner landscape, even though that's kind of a longish name. Um, to form a flourishing garden, and uh, even if you're not a gardener, I suspect that you will know this, but to, flor uh, to form a flourishing garden with healthy edibles, we have to tend to the soil by compiling nutrient-rich living organic mat matter. Yet unless we know about, about it, we're probably going to walk through this garden not even being aware of the dynamic life processes occurring in that soil. So if we, we use this metaphor, what are the nutrient-rich living elements in this in these more subtle realms, in this inner soil. So we could say that the fertile soil of an inner, that this is the fertile soil of the, our inner landscape in which we drop the seeds of our practices, which then break open to reach the light, where we become the type of person that would indeed nourish a society and is life affirming. So the question is, how do we make this inner soil fertile? If you go to uh, the next slide, that's slide 25, um, this, um, these are some very, I'm going to mention these and maybe give one example so that we can move on. Um, so these refer to actions that we're most probably doing already, but bringing, but bringing this process to, to the fore, shining a light on it, might help us be more conscious of this inner terrain and therefore might enable us to go there more intentionally to plant certain seeds. So examples would be agreements that we make with ourselves. And we all know that groups are more resilient when they make agreements at the outset. Uh, so this is also true as individuals. And one agreement might be that we, uh, uh, that I might agree to, to make sure that I spend 20 minutes a day doing a particular practice. This is a pro promise that I make to myself. And then the personal guiding principles. These are fundamental tenets that guide our lives toward a life-enhancing future. And an, an example of that one might be I peacefully accept reality as it is, and I contribute to the changes from this place of peaceful acceptance rather than a place of perpetual frustration with what is. And uh, the nourishing core beliefs, those, re those refer to enlivening fundamental views of the world. Uh, an example might be these times of transition are very exciting times to be alive. So if you uh, go to slide number 27, this is uh, where we, we're looking at some practices here and some life choices. Now, you'll, you'll notice that you're seeing uh, three circles interlaced with each other, and there's basically six practices here, although two of them are related to, to meditation. 
there's no one size fits all practice. Uh, what matters most is for each of us to identify the obstacles that are interfering with our own well-being or the quality that we want to develop and then to find the practices that transform the obstacles and nourish those qualities. There's many, uh, so I'm going to address some of them briefly and more than anything I'm going to focus on how they work together synergistically. Uh, so, but first let me say that practices are, uh, they, they really do Trans help support the transformative process. They increase self-awareness and they empower our capacities to manage ourselves. They ha help us dismantle conditioned habits and old dysfunctional beliefs. They certainly build our psychological immunity to psychological stress. So what we have here is um, the uh, contemplative practices like meditation, an empty mind, any kind of meditation or the meditation of empty mind. And we have the practice of positive thoughts, uh, the practice of nature connecting, the practice of harnessing or developing positive emotions, and the practice of yoga. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how they can blend, um, and then we'll go to life choices. So if uh, looking at the right uh, three tri uh, circles, if we are doing something in our work that requires courage and it's new, it's something new and it's taking us to the edge of our growth and um, we are finding ourselves feeling anxious or feeling nervous or feeling scared and we know that we want to cultivate courage, what we can do is remember a time in our lives when we have had the experience of courage. We can have that experience of courage right now and we can basically tap into it by remembering all the factors that went into cultivating that courage at that time and we can begin to enrich that emotion. Uh, this is, by the way, a practice that Rick Hansen uh, talks about called HEAL, H-E-A-L, and it's in the, I do have a slide that has resources and it's there that you can access it if you so choose. So you have the positive emotion, you enrich it by remembering the details of the time that you felt it, and then you absorb it, which means you bring it into the body. This is a whole body practice, and you, uh, you savor it. You basically hang out with that courage. And at the same time, what you can do is bring your body into it and do, get into some kind of a, a posture, even if it's, you don't know how to do yoga. Uh, there are several postures in yoga that cultivate courage like the warrior pose. But if, you don't, if you're not a yoga practitioner, you can just get into any physical posture that would uh, express courage and that will enhance the emotion that you're experiencing at the moment. And at the same time, what you're doing is emptying the mind so that you can get into your body and your feelings at that time. Now, it's critical to practice and mo most of us know this is that it's important to repeat them and to do them diligently. But it, the, uh, blending three practices like that or more can be very transformative. So if we move now to life choices, these are basically choices that we can make in our lives that can build our resilience. Um, these are worldviews. And uh, one, the first one is grief work. Uh, grief work uh, is it's so important, and that's one of the, the great gifts of the work that reconnects. It's just so important to ensure that we don't get stuck in our anger, in our pain for the world, that we move through it so that we don't carry the weight of that grief. Um, and there's a lot of ways that we can do grief work. We can access some of the practices of the work that we connect, or we can just simply talk to a friend who's going to be willing to listen and not feel like he has to or she has to fix anything. Then living from our inner gifts, and that is to basically recognize what our strengths are and to act in our in our uh, activism from that place and not from what we think we should be. So it really is about acting from our authenticity. And in it, when we do that, we're going to flow more easily and we're going to actually build resilience uh, by, 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 by living more authentically because we're not running up against our own false selves. 
adopting an evolutionary perspective, uh, this is very useful because uh, we can often get lost in the moment of what's happening right now in our country, in our community, in our team. Uh, so when we adopt a, a long view, an evolutionary perspective, that can be very helpful to help us understand what's going on right now. Uh, and a health, uh, good, two, two good sources for that are uh, certainly the spiral dynamics uh, map and um, and learning more about the story of the universe. Um, gracefully navigating liminal time, really committing to being very great, uh, gra uh, grateful for what modern times do give us. Uh, and there are a lot of gifts in these industrial times, and we can learn to appreciate them while at the same time changing what's not working and moving into a more, sus more sustainable cultures. And then multidimensional balancing, what that refers to is making sure if, if you have a tendency to be very intellectual, it's very useful to, to build resilience to make sure that you're using your hands as well and your intuition as well. Um, and uh, your body as well. So it's really good to access the intelligence that exists within us that is not just of one of one kind. And finally, to move into the we, what we can do as a life choice is make it a priority to co-create community circles. So if you go to slide 28, so Veronica Goodchild says, a new consciousness is arising in us and around us. We long for it, she says, and we need to help each other strengthen its reality. So how do we help how do we help each other strengthen its reality? So if we go to slide number twenty nine, what we can do and I'm when we enter into we territory, we begin to tread into terrain that the collaboration training that Don Hall is going to be doing. And, um, uh, and it, during that training, there's a lot of wonderful skills that are addressed like collaboration skills and conflict resolution skills. So um, instead, what I'm going to focus on briefly here for a minute is our, what are the inner qualities that actually nourish our relational skills? And those are the, uh, the overarching uh, inner quality is the quality of receptivity. And within that receptivity is uh, the capacity to have empathy. And we know that now more than ever it's important for us to be able to see another person's perspective and to be able to ex not only feel empathy for where another person is at, but also to know how to express it to be able to communicate to other people um, authentically, I see where you're at, or to somehow mirror back to them what you hear them saying in an active listening way. So it's not just about feeling empathy, but also about learning how to express it. This is very helpful in groups because what happens is that people start to feel seen and heard, and that alone uh, builds group cohesion. Um, re related to empathy re and part of receptivity, it, particularly when we are working in our community circles, is to surrender to the group field to know that there is something much greater in our surrounding than just our thoughts and our perspectives. And this is really permaculture principle number one, which is observe, observe, observe. Notice what's in the group field. Notice what is emerging and stay curious and even playful about what is happening around us. Um, and, of course, this does not mean that there won't be moments when there are things that we need to feel, that we feel strongly about, that we need to express. Uh, it, there might be even times when we have non-negotiable issues, so we want to express those with equanimity and with resolve. So um, those are some of the inner qualities that we can nourish uh, that actually are relevant to uh, relational skills. Um, but what we can also do is begin to uh, organize uh, in, uh, community circles that are specifically focused on um, on the inner dimensions uh, of our of our transition. And um, 
what we do here is uh, this is an example what's in this circle here on slide 29. Um, what, what we can do is commit, make a, a, an overt statement of what our commitment is to exploring and cultivating the inner qualities that are aligned with a life-enhancing world and what we believe in. For example, I believe that inner work is an essential aspect of the great turning and what we're intentionally designed to do. Uh, as a circle to support each other kindly and so thoughtfully, etc. And I contacted three of the people that are doing workshops, and there's uh, community circles, as I'm calling them, emerging and going on in our country. So Emily Jarrett, who's doing a Jikong workshop, she has guardian. She's talked about guardian wisdom circles, and they are all in the uh, resource uh, slide. Uh, and Jewel Bestrova, who's doing a, a workshop on sacred activism, and she has Era of Change, and they have inner resilience groups. And Kaya Sien, who I think is on the call, uh, she has Mindfulness for Changing Times, which focuses on building skills for inner healing and transformation and addresses many of the topics that, we just, that I just covered today. Um, so it's already happening, and what, what I would love to see happen is for us to get together and at the gathering and talk more about how to nourish that that uh, that which is that it, which is emerging already in regards to to the groups that exist. So just as a closing comment, if you go to slide 30, uh, all I want to say here is that um, when we when we are resilient, when we that when we fulfill that psychological imperative, and we we're well. Uh, from the inside out, we become much more effective evolutionary catalysts, to use Michael Brownlee's term, uh, and much more effective visionary artisans of cultural renaissance, to borrow Bill Plotkin's term. And if you go to uh, slide 31, uh, there are some resources there on uh, examples of inner work that are already happening and some good news sources and eco-psychology, some practices, some research. This, this research um, piece, uh, which is the Garrison Institute, they've done a lot of research on the relationship between contemplative practices and, re and building resilience and nature. And the last slide, uh, slide 32, is where we're going to kind of gather in this virtual circle uh, in the Minnesota forest to share your thoughts. Um, your, based on your experiences. And I'm certainly open uh, to respond to any questions. I know that I went through this material very, very quickly. And, uh, but also I welcome uh, disagreements. I think diversity is really healthy. Uh, but very much welcome your thoughts about how you would answer some of those questions or anything you would like to add to the conversation. Great. So thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction to the, the inner terrain of transition, Rebecca. And uh, at this point, we'll, we have a few minutes uh, to field comments and questions from those of you who are attending this call. Uh, all you need to do is tap one on your keypad, and uh, we'll call on you and unmute you, and then you can speak. So please hit one on your keypad if you have a question or comment, um, anything that you know really struck you strongly about Rebecca's presentation, anything that uh, you know you had a little bit of a different perspective on. Um, just want to open up the conversation. Okay, see a couple hands going up now. Uh, we'll go with Kaya first, and then to June, and then to Caroline. So Kaya, I believe so, you are on the air. Okay, thank you. Well, I'm um, happy to participate in this uh, webinar. And one of the things I'm noticing now is that after having listened to Rebecca and watched the PowerPoint, I can just feel my heart kind of opening and strengthening and this reminds me that one of the major kind of resiliency uh, supports that I have for myself is I try, you know, uh, once or twice a week to listen to a sage like Rebecca speak about what is the wisdom that we know 
that carries us through this time. And that I find that so helpful. If I do that, then I can take in, you know, more of the suffering and and keep my vision um, full of heart and interconnection because of um, talks like this. So that's um, that's just it's been very powerful for me. This this one really was today. And then I guess one more comment. Another thing that's um, helping me a lot too is to just recognize in, in that evolutionary perspective that uh, that we're shifting now from separation consciousness to relational consciousness or unitive consciousness called a lot of other things. And so it, it helps me keep my compassion to realize that a lot of what a lot of the um, actions that are being taken that are so destructive to the harmony that many of us can um, can understand and believe in um, are coming from a consciousness that is still rooted in us each being separate beings. And so having to look out for number one because no one else will. And um, that also then helps me uh, choose how I'm going to relate to people that I I'm guessing might be in that separation consciousness. Um, so thank you very much for the um, webinar, Rebecca, and then for giving us a chance to speak. Thank you, Kaya. I really appreciate what you shared and very much look forward to meeting you. Uh, and yes, I'm so with you regarding separation consciousness uh, versus uh, relational consciousness. Yes, a big yes to that. <laughs> Great, thank you. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so we'll go next to June, and then Caroline, and then Paul. Hi, this is June, and I just want to add my thanks. I'm feeling utterly blown away um, after listening in. And, uh, you know, I'm just really curious um, where this kind of thinking um, where you're doing it or, you know, like, is there a place um, where this is kind of coming together because uh, I just never heard of all the connections you're making and, um, and it's, it's wonderful and I just want to learn more. Ah. Oh, that's wonderful to hear your uh, your beginner's mind. Really nice. Uh, if, um, yeah, good question. Where is this thinking taking place? Where is this consciousness emerging? And my my take on it is that it's emerging all over the world. And uh, I I tap into it very regularly. So it's been so much fun for me to put some some factors together and connect some dots but uh, it's it's emerging everywhere and if, if you I, you go to some of the resources that I shared in the semi and one of the last slides uh, you may want to you may want to tap into that and check some things out and uh, certainly Animus Valley Institute is a wonderful wonderful resource in our nation um, the work that reconnects uh, is another one. So thank you for sharing your your blown awayness. You're welcome. Great. Well, uh, we'll go to Caroline and Paul, and then I think we'll need to wrap up. Yeah, thanks, Rebecca. And I was wondering, um, in the day-long intensive, um, what other things that you'll be doing and focusing on? So thank yeah. you. Yeah, you're welcome, Caroline. Um, yeah, we're going to um, go deeper into uh, a lot of what we've talked about, but one of the things that I want to do in that intensive is to um, see, even though we're going to follow those four questions as guidelines, we're going to... Uh, so we'll have that structure. We're going to see what people are actually experiencing in their own uh, communities and in their own lives that is challenging their resilience and um, and and and, their, and addressing those in the as much as we possibly can in the intensive. So even though I'm going to bring 
information and um, and and some structure. I'm going to be relatively fluid to try to address and uh, really have it be organic so that it it it, it does respond to the need uh, in that room. Uh, and and we'll we'll talk about uncertainties. We'll talk about uh, if there's people in the room that have practices, we, we might actually tap into them. Um, I might f- focus more on particular stressors. What I don't want to do though is to impose those stressors on the on the group. What I'd rather do is I see what the people are struggling with. I um, but but for example, one of the um, one of the risk factors that I think is really um, pretty universal, and I could be wrong, is that notion of living in between two worlds and the tension that that causes. Uh, and, and that, so I'm, I, I'll definitely bring that, and I'll actually bring some practices that we can do. So we'll delve into it conversationally more deeply, and we'll do some practices. And the first half is going to be more focused on our relationship to ourselves. And the second part is going to be more focused on how we can support each other. Great. Sounds wonderful. Thanks, Rebecca. You're welcome. And uh, we'll go to Paul for one more closing comment or question. Yeah, um, thank you so much. I found this absolutely fascinating, both the presentation and the slides. And um, my my issue or problem with it was that I was completely overwhelmed by the fifth or tenth slide, um, and I could barely take in anything else after that. It was just um, a complete over, overmaxed you know, my, got way past over capacity for me personally. It doesn't sound like the others had that experience who are responding. So um, for me, what I would have loved to have moved a lot slower through a lot less material and had more of us participating. That's just my own my own evaluation, but absolutely fascinating material. Well, I'm... Um- Thank you, Paul, and I'm actually not surprised to hear you saying that. That that uh, that was my concern, actually, and uh, I was the biggest challenge was to um, nail down the information to the bullet points, um, and I worked really hard to do that and continued to feel like this was way too much information. So your feedback is very well taken, and uh, I'll I'll, uh, I'll I'm very happy to actually give it a lot more thought and. And, 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 and implement a way in which the material doesn't have to be so overwhelming. But I'm not surprised to hear you saying that, and I uh, appreciate your openness about it. Sure. Great. Well, uh, Rebecca, any other final reflections before I give a couple announcements? I think um, all I'd like to say is that um, even though I did this presentation, my preference, uh, my very strong preference, is to explore the inner world in circle formats uh, through conversation and um, and uh, shared leadership, where all of us share what we uh, sense is going on, and all of us share our uncertainties as well. So my hope, my strong, strong hope is that uh, we can begin to um, explore how we can do that at the gathering in St. Paul. Well, thank you, Rebecca, for a wonderful presentation. Thanks to everybody for coming. Uh, Again, uh, if you want to go deeper with this work, uh, Rebecca will be giving a pre-gathering intensive on Friday, uh, July 28th at our Transition U.S. National Gathering at McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota. And you can go to transitiongathering.org to find more information about that and to sign up. Uh, Again, we have another teleseminar coming up on Monday, uh, July 10th, with Tina Clark on taking your transition initiative to the next level. And you can go to uh, the Transition U.S. Facebook page under events to find out more about that. Um, If you didn't get the slides for this presentation, uh, you can also go to the Transition U.S. website. 
Uh, there will be a link to this teleseminar, Deep Resilience from Me to We, on the main page. Uh, you can download the PDF from there. And in about two weeks, uh, there should be a recording of this uh, up on our online training archive, uh, which is also at transitionus.org. So uh, go check that out. There's you know dozens, if not hundreds, of past webinars and teleseminars uh, posted there. Uh, a lot of great material to 